The AMD X870 series of boards are here at last, and as is often the case with a new motherboard lineup, well, there are a lot of them. We have seven of the latest motherboards from ASUS, and even that is just scratching the surface of what's actually going to be available. While the X870 and X870e range is available today, and that makes up the higher end segment of the market, we also have B850 and B840, which will be coming in the near future. And don't worry, we'll be covering those as soon as they're released to the market. Now, that's not to say that X870 and X870e are specifically for the high end, because ASUS have a selection that stem from an ITX pint-sized powerhouse board all the way to the ATX Crosshair Hero, and everything in between. And we'll be taking a look at all of them in detail today to find out what you get for your money, not only from the chipset, but also in terms of the improved VRM design over the predecessor, and those unique, nifty little features that we as enthusiasts all crave. Now, in terms of CPU support, this is an area where AMD have always held strong compared to the competition from Intel. An X870 and X870e comes loaded with support for AMD Ryzen 7000, 8000, and the newest 9000 series processors, which will include X3D variants in the very near future, thanks to the continued support of the AM5 socket. This means that if you're already rocking a 7000 series CPU, then you can simply upgrade your board by dropping your CPU straight in and by using your existing DDR5 memory that you already own. So for those of you not in the know, there are some distinct differences with the X870 and X870e chipsets, and arguably more so than what we saw between X670 and X670e. But let's talk about the similarities at the same time. The biggest similarity comes down to PCI Express 5.0 lanes, of which both now support those blistering fast speeds for your 16 5.0 lanes for your GPU, which come directly from the processor, and four for your M.2 drives. This was done so that AMD aren't reliant on the motherboard vendors, like ASUS, to use slower and older 4.0 lanes, because it's all being handled directly by the processor. Though we do still get 20 PCI Express 4.0 lanes on the X870e chipset and 12 on X870, thanks again to the chipset. Along with this, the biggest differences that you'll see will come down to the amount of USB ports, which is double on the X870e and SATA ports, where we also see four on X870 and eight on X870e. And on top of that, we now have much faster USB ports, so I guess future-proofing you. Now, consider it as X870e having greater connectivity options for those who want or need more USB connections or more SATA ports. And this is where the extra added value of moving up in chipset is. And it's quite clear to work out what chipset is, I guess, specifically right for you and what you're actually going to get from it, at least in terms of features. On top of that, and I guess one of the biggest selling points comes down to USB. And all X870 and X870e boards come with USB 4 as standard. And with any new standard, we should start to see the adoption rate pick up quite rapidly as more consumers buy the boards. And then the need for the corresponding drives and devices to run on them will come a little bit later. And this is especially handy for, well, people like us who are content creators, where at least on the video side, we are constantly transferring large, raw Blackmagic video files to and from different computers. So a little bit of a godsend. Of course, on top of this, there's nothing to stop board vendors, like ASUS, from adding in even more functionality. And of course, this is all reflected in the price, because as we all know, motherboards don't typically give us more performance, but instead give us more features. And this is, well, the big selling point of moving up to X870e. Though, of course, if money is an important factor, then X870 still offers a huge uplift in terms of features over its predecessor, X670. Now, ASUS have taken things, let's say, one step further. Look at Wi-Fi, for instance. Whether it's X870 or X870e, for ASUS boards at least, if the model name has Wi-Fi in it, then it comes included with Wi-Fi 7. Though there are non-Wi-Fi boards for those, again, who maybe want to save a little on cost and don't necessarily need those features. So back to the point in hand, we've got quite a few motherboards to cover today with seven different models covering the Prime, Strix, Crosshair, ProArt, Tough Gaming series. So there really is a bit of something for everyone. They're all ATX motherboards with the exception of the ASUS ROG Strix X870i gaming Wi-Fi, which is actually the only mini ITX motherboard that we're covering today. Now, the beauty of ASUS boards is that they typically have something for everyone. 
and it's split into different ranges. And sometimes, I will be honest, it's a tricky one because each series has its own range of features and there's quite a bit of crossover from one to the other. However, I'll see if I can explain it in as broad a sense as possible. So starting things off with the Prime series, which is the more cost-effective segment for ASUS. So it trims a few features down to keep the cost down, such as only having two M.2 heatsinks, despite having four M.2 mounts. The VRM configuration is not as extreme either, and it has fewer Gen 5 mounts, using more affordable PCI Express 4.0 and 3.0 technology for some features. VRM is often split into two or three sections, so X plus Y plus Z, with X being the largest number going to the vCore for the CPU, Y for the SOC, dealing with PCI Express, storage and memory, and Z for additional miscellaneous hardware. The colour scheme normally consists of a black PCB and silver accents through way of the chipset heatsink, VRM cooling, which merges into the I.O. and M.2 shielding. It's also aimed at those who are maybe first time builders and with a big push from ASUS on easier build customization, there's some features that have been added to this more budget friendly range, including the built in I.O. cover, BIOS flashback functionality and the various latching technologies, including Q-latch for your M.2 drives, Q antenna for quick attachment and detachment of the Wi-Fi 7 antennas and Q-release for your top PCI Express slot, which I'll be honest is a godsend for reviewers who are constantly swapping out GPUs. Though the range is classed as affordable, thanks to the chipset and the little tweaks that ASUS have implemented, you really do get much more for your money now compared to boards of yesteryear. And the Prime range really does tick a lot of boxes for first time builders or system integrators. Next up is the Tough Gaming series, which are also generally classed as more affordable motherboards, much like the Prime series, but with more robust components and hardware, as in literally making the Tough board tough. T-O-U-G-H, which makes them more reliable and resilient to heavy workloads, while not going too crazy on features to again keep the price much more reasonable. You typically see a more premium power delivery design with tough gaming boards along with better quality components, and on X870 it's no exception, along with the likes of pro cool power connectors with solid pins, so it does seem that ASUS have a much larger focus compared to the competition on solid, stable and reliable operation. In terms of cooling, you'll generally find a lot larger heatsinks for your M.2 slots, improved chipset cooling and VRM heatsinks, and also more sensors and fan headers, giving you even more control over your system's operation and seeing exactly what it's doing through relevant software at all times. Again, DIY building is made simple thanks to Q-release, Q-antenna, Q-latch and BIOS flashback, and this just further improves on making building PCs much simpler for those who have maybe never built a computer before and just generally taken the fear out of it. The Pro Art is marketed at creators, so it still has mostly the same hardware as more high-end gaming focused motherboards, such as plenty of PCI Express 5.0 and Gen 5.0 M.2s, as well as a more powerful VRM and cooling configuration, but its aesthetics are more tuned to have a broader appeal. It features a more refined, classic aesthetic that would suit a build that doesn't have all the flashing ARGB lights, and instead looks like it means business. No fuss, no frills, just solid components and high-end features. And that mainly comes down to the connectivity. So you'll often see 10 gigabit per second LAN and more USB ports, including dual USB 4 in the case of the Creator Wi-Fi that we have here. Again, in terms of power delivery, that will see a beefier setup that has a higher rating per stage. And this helps to get the very best performance out of your components. Because with the Pro Art series, if you're using it as a designer, a modeler, an editor, or just a general content creator, time is money. So making sure that you have a stable and top performing system is key. This is why we find more and faster M.2 and PCI Express slots, quick charging for USB devices, and the ability to support larger displays directly from the motherboard's I.O. But one of the most interesting set of features for me, again, comes down to the easy PC DIY, with the ability to simply pull your graphics card out without pressing any buttons or latches, along with a completely tool-free M.2 Q release and one finger installation of your NVMe drives. Though if you have a smaller form factor drive, you can use Q-Slide to lock it into place. Next up is the Strix series, which are high-end to enthusiast-grade gaming motherboards. So again, a really strong focus on fast storage, extreme memory performance, larger VRM configurations, and more robust heatsinks and armor for both aesthetic reasons and to ensure maximum performance for overclocking or maxing out the more extreme gaming CPUs. In terms of the aesthetics, you'll find the inclusion of RGB to really spice up your build, which, of course, you get full control over using ASUS's own software to really dial in how the whole system looks overall. 
And if you want something really unique, then the X870A gaming Wi-Fi comes in with a white PCB, white Ascent, and some silver added visuals to add a more premium touch to the board. You also get a choice with Strix as it's arguably the largest range of boards with Dash A, Dash E, Dash F, which are all ATX size boards, and then Dash I, which is ITX form factor. Depending on the features you need, you'll find that they coincide with the cost of the board, and you can see where the extra added value goes. More and faster connectivity options, much more powerful power delivery solutions, and plentiful cooling that almost in some cases, like on the Dash E gaming Wi-Fi, fully encompasses the board to cater for the total of five M.2 slots. As the boards are aimed at the enthusiast and high-end segment, we also get up to dual ProCool 2 power connectors, faster memory support, and some individuality for troubleshooting and overclocking, including debug LEDs, power and reset buttons, and clear CMOS and BIOS flashback buttons. Then there's the X870-I, which is going to appeal to those wanting a small form factor build without sacrificing on functionality, as we still have two M.2 slots, super fast memory support, and VRMs that are rated for 110 amps, so no slouch. There's also the full plethora of Q features on some boards, including M.2 Q release, Q slide, Q latch, and again, that really handy Q release for your graphics card by just pulling on the card. So no need for push down latches or buttons on a lot of these boards. Then lastly, we have Crosshair. Now Crosshair is top end, so it's got everything you can think of and usually multiples of everything. So it's common to see many Gen 5 M.2 mounts, multiple Gen 5 PCIe slots, flagship memory performance, connectivity, networking, and significantly upgraded VRMs, heat sinks, and armor throughout. So these boards are built for no compromise performance. Now aesthetically, they go all in with large covers over the VRMs and IO, as well as the five M.2 slots, because not only does it add to the styling, which well, really works with the ROG logo splattered across it and the obvious ROG RGB lighting, but it helps aid with cooling because well, Gen 5 devices are known for getting toasty. And the last thing that you want is to see thermal throttling. On the crosshair, you'll also find a lot more fan headers for assisting with cooling because, well, it's boards like this that can really assist with setting records. Though, it wouldn't surprise me if an extreme variant launches at a later date, specifically aimed at those wanting to set those all-important world records. For connectivity, this is where things generally go a bit crazy, but in a good way, as we find dual USB 4 ports, 5G and 2.5G Ethernet, tons of other USB ports of varying speeds, and even a slim SAS connector to expand your storage capabilities beyond the 5 M.2 slots and 4 SATA ports. Beyond the mass amounts of Q features like Q release, Q slide, Q latch, PCIe slot Q release slim, Q antenna, and Q code, we also have Q LED, which tells you which part of the boot process you're currently at. So you're probably starting to see a bit of a trend with how Azusa putting a very, very big focus on making their products the easiest to use on the market. Now VRMs or phases are by far one of the biggest factors in what actually defines what category a motherboard fits into. And ASUS really does have a broad range of options here. Most boards ranging from the more budget focused up to the high end typically come with an eight layer PCB design. While the mini ITX board has a 10 layer PCB, which is more robust and uses more copper for improved signal integrity, enhanced power delivery and better thermal management. So higher VRM configurations tend to be mounted on thicker PCB designs or when you have less surface area like a mini ITX board. Now the mini ITX Strix X870i gaming Wi-Fi features the smallest VRM configuration of the ASUS X870 lineup, obviously with it being a smaller motherboard. It uses a 10 plus two plus one configuration, which is more than enough to ensure the most powerful CPUs can hit their boost clocks. However, pushing bigger overclocks and ensuring your system can maintain those boost clocks for extended periods, such as while rendering video, you'll benefit from a more comprehensive VRM configuration, and more so still from one that can be cooled efficiently. For these, you'll find the Prime X870P Wi-Fi comes with a 14 plus two plus one configuration, while the X870E Creator Wi-Fi comes with 16 plus two plus two. For gamers, again, you'll likely spend long periods with the CPU under heavy usage, which is why the Strix boards all typically have a 16 plus two plus two configuration like the Dash A gaming, so similar to the Creator Wi-Fi, while the Dash E and Crosshair Hero expand upon that further to 18 plus two plus two. Then the Tough X870 Plus is kind of similar, coming in with 16 plus two plus one phases. 
Now, while the number of phases can be key for providing adequate power to the CPU's vCore, SOC, and miscellaneous components, the rated power also has a key impact. And ASUS have again stepped up their game here with the vCore phases and SOC phases, predominantly using SPS phases, or Smart Power Stage. The Prime X870-P Wi-Fi uses Dr. MOS, which slightly differently combines a MOSFET driver and one or more MOSFETs in a single package, and are generally found with synchronous buck converters. Now, sometimes we do find, like with the Tough Board and Creator Wi-Fi Board, a mixture of SPS and Dr. Moss phases, depending on the delivery design, and, of course, what works more efficiently and is more cost-effective as well. Power-wise, we find the Tough and the Prime Board using 80 amp stages, while the Dash A increases beyond that to 90 amps across vCore, SOC, and miscellaneous, while the higher-end Strix boards increase this again to 110 amps for a more powerful solution. Though as we all know, this, much like we saw on X670 and X670E, is well beyond what's needed, even with a flagship CPU with an overclock. In terms of which MOSFETs are used, ASUS use a variety of brands including Vichet, SIC, 850A, 110 amp phases for the Dash E, Hero and Dash I boards, while they use the SIC 629 Dr. MOS 80 amp phases for the Dash P Wi-Fi, and then MPS MP86670 80 amp phases for the likes of the Creator Wi-Fi and Tough Plus Wi-Fi. Though for the miscellaneous phases on some of the boards, like the Creator Wi-Fi, they've gone with the Alpha and Omega AOZ53071 QI 80 amp stages instead. Then for the controller of choice, for the most part, ASUS seem to have plumped for the DigiPlus PWM controller from Infineon, which is sometimes mounted on the front of the board for the lower end and the rear of the board for the higher end of the scale. And this ranges from the ASP 2205, 2206 or 2308 controllers, which are all rated differently. Now, when it comes to testing VRM performance, there's well, multiple ways to do it, including using the likes of HW Info to measure what the sensor tells you, or to use K-type probes. Or, to get a better, well-rounded picture, you can use both, which is exactly what we've done here today. We took the ambient temperature of the room, which we control using a mobile air conditioning unit, which isn't perfect, but it does allow us to stay true to what we're trying to do, and at least, I guess, to make our test as fair as physically possible. We then leave the system sitting on the desktop, idling for about 10 minutes so it can settle before taking out idle readings on both HW Info and then the two probes. After this, we wanted to simulate a, let's call it worst case scenario, using Prime95 with small FFTs to generate the most heat possible, as well as then doing the same test using Cinebench 2024 to simulate more common real world usage. We run each test for an hour along with letting the temperatures settle down between each test, again to try and make things as fair as possible. Now the probes are fixed to the back of each board and we generally use one on the top row of phases and then the top phase of the column going down the board and position the probes a few millimetres away from the actual circuitry itself. You will find that the software readings from the sensor will vary quite wildly in areas and this is down to the sensor location for one and if the sensor is reporting the internal temperature instead which based on our testing and the sensor data generally reading higher, that is actually the case. And obviously with our probes where they're slightly just a few millimeters away from the actual phases, that's why you're going to see slightly different results there. For testing, we used the 9950X to push the VRMs as far as we could, along with 32 gig of XPG Lancer Blade, 6000 megahertz CL30 memory, and an NVIDIA RTX 4090 Founders Edition graphics card. For our storage, we used a Seagate Firecuda 540 2TB Gen 5 NVMe drive, and to keep everything cool, we used the NZXT Kraken 360ml AIO liquid cooler to keep things under control. And all of our testing was done inside the NZXT H7 flow case with the side panels installed to simulate real world usage. When we look at our table, we can see that every board did exceptionally well with nothing hitting over 80 degrees Celsius. With our highest result coming from the X870-I Gaming Wi-Fi Mini ITX board at 75 degrees on the sensor temperature during Prime 95, while our highest probe temperature was 68.8 degrees from probe one on the same board again during our Prime 95 hour long run. But as it is such a small board, that's pretty much expected anyway. Our best result in the probes came from the Tough Gaming X870 Plus Wi-Fi at 39.4 degrees during our Cinebench run, and only a little higher under Prime 95 at 40.7 degrees. Though in both cases, Probe 2 did come up slightly warmer, but not by anything of significant margin. 
For the most part, though, the average across the boards collectively was around 56 degrees, with some coming in a little bit higher and some a little bit lower, but overall showing us that the cooling solutions were doing a great job at keeping things under control. Now, in terms of cost, it's an interesting one because prices of everything have, well, risen since the launch of the X670 and X670E range of boards. And to see how far things have come in terms of evolution, especially with the cost of materials, it's always good to compare like for like, though there are some key differences with some of the boards. Starting from the top, the X670-P Wi-Fi originally launched at $299, while the X870 version is coming in almost 17% cheaper, which is very good news for the consumer, as you're now getting more features and a newer board for less cost at $249. The Strix X870E-E gaming Wi-Fi sees no change at $499, so again, it can be argued that you're getting a lot more board with a lot more features for the same money. And the same for the ITX board, though pricing hasn't been 100% confirmed for this model, and the same for the Crosshair Hero. The Creator Wi-Fi has seen a small drop in price by 4%, which is nice to see considering that it's one of the most feature-packed boards with 10 GB LAN and tons of connectivity options. Then lastly, there's the Dash A and the Tough Gaming, which have seen price drops of just under 8% and just over 6% respectively. So all in all, some pretty aggressive pricing from ASUS, while also packing a lot more under the hood. So hopefully that's given you an idea as to what's on offer from ASUS. A board seemingly for every person and every budget, with features to match. It's really impressive as to how easy building PCs has become. And with the easy PC DIY features that these boards now include, that's now made it even easier for novice first-time builders and, of course, system integrators who are building tens of hundreds of computers a day. VRM performance is strong across the board and has a lot of headroom available for running the latest flagship processor like the 9950X that we used and also utilising maybe a healthy overclock too, all while remaining cool, even under the most extreme loads, whether that be simulated Prime 95 type workloads or more real-world scenarios like Cinebench, so we thought we'd show you both. No matter the board that we tested today, they all came in at very, very comfortable levels. So there you have it. What's your favourite board from what we've actually looked at today? Are you after maybe something more affordable that ticks all the right boxes, like the Dash P or the Tough Gaming? Or maybe something with a bit more glitz, like the Dash A in white or Dash E with its RGB lighting? Or maybe the Crosshair Hero is the one for you with its huge amounts of features and robust components? Or are you after something smaller form factor, like the X870-i gaming Wi-Fi packing a punch as a pint-sized powerhouse? Either way, there's plenty of boards launching, and we have full reviews on all of them over on etechnics.com, as well as videos coming out for each board. So make sure you're subscribed for that. For now, yeah, it's been a lot of work, but that's going to wrap this one up. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, a like and a subscribe to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, and consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to exclusive behind-the-scenes content, including our new office move, bi-weekly game nights, access to a lot of our testing data, and much, much more. The link is, as always, down below. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.